So let's take a quick look at the headlines this week. The Mueller report, the criminal investigation of Boeing, college admission scandals, Brexit, the aftermath of the attacks on two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. What do these all have in common? It's one word. Anybody? Exceptionalism. Exceptionalism. Exceptionalism is our topic today. Exceptionalism is the notion that someone, or often a group of someones, are somehow higher, more elevated, more refined, more special, more entitled, more blessed than everybody else. Rather than strengthening a sense of interdependence and solidarity, exceptionalism serves to reinforce barriers and separations and divisions. To paraphrase St. Augustine, sin leads us to curve in on ourselves. Exceptionalism does just that. It blinds us to the realities of others, especially those at the margins. It blinds us to our own failings in the past. And it reinforces hypocrisy in the present. And it blinds us to the deeper motives of those who benefit from the status quo. It's exceptionalism that would puff up a political leader to believe he's above the law and can make his own rules. It's exceptionalism that drives a company to put profits over safety and hold their breath, hoping they are too big to fail. It's exceptionalism that whispers in the ears of the powerful and wealthy that it's okay to rig the system, just a benefit of having made the big time. As the UK takes a deep look at how it lives in relationship with the rest of Europe and the rest of the world, as it considers exiting the European Union, certainly the topic of exceptionalism is one that must be grappled with. Here in the United States, we have our own brand, American exceptionalism. Great libraries could be filled on the many works written about American exceptionalism, tracing back at least as far as John Winthrop's famous Model of Christian Charity sermon, given in 1630, during which he cast a vision for his fellow Massachusetts Bay colonists of a city upon a hill, coming directly from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It received a descriptive vocabulary in Alexis de Tocqueville's Observations in Democracy in America, and it took on a new and deadly force with the myth of manifest destiny, which was used to justify both expansion of the American empire following the U.S., Mexican, and Spanish-American wars, and the violent domination of people of color domestically. During the season of Lent, and as we approach our 350th anniversary year, we've committed ourselves to the important work of deep introspection and repentance for some of the corporate and systemic sins that we really must face up to. Environmental devastation, racism, patriarchy and sexism, and each of these rooted in exceptionalism. Each of these rooted in the idea that a particular group is somehow more important, more special, more entitled, more blessed than everyone else. Today we look at American exceptionalism and in a moment we'll be reading a litany together of repentance for exceptionalism and particularly American exceptionalism and it is long and it could have been a lot longer. There's much to atone for. But I could not preach a sermon about exceptionalism <clears throat> without taking a moment to talk about Christian exceptionalism. It's undeniable that for centuries, the Christian church and nations that considered themselves part of Christendom claimed a particular chosenness, a particular godliness, a perspective that viewed Christian society as civilized and everyone else as heathen. It was Christian exceptionalism that launched the Crusades, that stoked the Spanish Inquisition, that inspired chattel slavery and wars of conquest. While we know that Christianity has also brought great good to the world, 
we have to reckon with the ways in which our religion has been twisted to justify evil. When I was a youth, that is, when I was in youth group, I had a prayer partner named Shawnee P, who made me a poster that I hung up over my bed. It had a beautiful rainbow and some butterfly stickers and that last line from the scripture lesson that we read today. I read that line every night before going to bed. It's one of very few scriptures that I have fully memorized. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It is the thing I say to myself when I'm anxious. It's the thing I say to myself when I need to pluck up some courage. It means so much to me. And then I went to seminary. <laughs> and I read the verse in context. In today's scripture lesson, Joshua has just been handed the reins and is the new leader of the Israelite people. He's stepping into Moses' sandals, and after wandering in the wilderness for a generation, they are on the verge of the promised land. It's within sight. And God speaks to Joshua, commissions him, blesses him, and promises, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. You shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore their ancestors to give them. The only problem is Canaan, the promised land, was no more empty than America was when the indigenous peoples of this land discovered Columbus, hungry, sick, and lost on our shores. Thus begins the chosen people's conquest of the promised land. We have to boldly face the past, face the ways in which our national pride and our religious tradition have been used to justify warfare, the theft of land and resources, and the dehumanizing treatment of people that we have deemed other. But how do we reconcile all of this with our commitment to follow Jesus? the one who taught us to love our neighbor, no exception. I have two thoughts. The first comes from that very verse in Joshua. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I'm fond of saying that God refuses to be put into any box. God is not located only in one temple, only accessible to the most holy or the most respectable. God's blessings are not only upon one nation, one people, one group of believers. No. God is with you, whoever you are, wherever you go. And for us who believe in Jesus, we follow a Christ who promises, wherever two or more are gathered, I am there. Christ is not just here. Christ is everywhere transcending all barriers, showing up in even the most unlikely of places. My second thought comes from the story of the Syrophoenician woman. You remember that one? A woman comes to Jesus saying, please help. My daughter is possessed by a demon. I need your healing strength. And Jesus says, do you remember? Did he say, you betcha I'm on it? No. He says, let the children first be fed, since it isn't good to take bread out of the children's mouths and throw it to the dogs. Basically, he says, I'm here for the Jews, not for the Syrophoenicians. Why should I give my healing power to someone who isn't a chosen one? But the woman says to him, Sir, even the dogs under the table get to eat the scraps that the children drop. The woman stands up and reflects back to Jesus what he has just said. And Jesus is changed. Jesus gets over this ingrained, millennia ingrained exceptionalism. And he turns back to her. Some might say he repents. He turns back around and he heals her daughter immediately. Jesus knew the truth about exceptionalism, 
The last shall be first. The first shall be last. Love your neighbor as yourself. No exception. Even Jesus, God incarnate, knows the power of repentance, of turning back around. We cannot change the past, but we must face up to it. As James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. This is why the act of repentance is so important. We remember Samuel Sewell, who served as judge over the Salem witch trials, who later came to recognize that Christian exceptionalism had turned his heart towards injustice and dehumanization, who stood before the congregation of this church while a public confession was read aloud to, quote, take the shame and the blame of it. In Sewell, this act of confession and repentance made a change in him. He was inspired to turn his life in a new direction, to fight for the abolition of slavery, and to dismantle notions of exceptionalism that would name one group of people more chosen and deny the dignity and humanity of others. The other major headline in the news today is about the aftermath of the attacks on two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. We know the horrors of those attacks and the motivations, white supremacy, anti-Muslim hate, currently two of this nation's top exports. While the pain of these tragedies cannot be erased, the work must now be to ensure that their suffering is not in vain. We repent our part through our, in, through our actions and inactions in allowing anti-Muslim hate, white supremacy, and exceptionalism to continue in any corner of God's creation. And we seek to turn back around, to take direct action to address the harm done. By the way, there are at least four ways to undermine exceptionalism in your bulletin insert this morning. Repentance is an act of hope. Hope that says things didn't go as they should have. Things are not as they could be. But transformation is real. Healing is real. Resurrection is real. Repentance is the thing that breaks us open and allows for the possibility of transformation, transforming of our hearts, transforming of the world. Through repentance, forgiveness is made real, and grace has true power. It is the calisthenics of our faith. <laughs>